Fisting Society by Eric Fromm, Chapter One. Are we sane? Nothing is more common than the idea that we, the people living in the Western world of the twentieth century, are eminently sane. Even the fact that a great number of individuals in our midst, midst, suffer from more or less severe forms of mental illness, produces little doubt with respect to the general standard of our mental health. And as far as individual mental disturbances are concerned, we look at them as strictly individual incidents, perhaps with some amazement that so many of these incidents should occur in a culture which is supposedly so sane. Can we be so sure that we that we are not deceiving ourselves? Many and in many an inmate of an insane asylum is convinced that everybody else is crazy except himself. Many a severe neurotic believes that his compulsive rituals or his hysterical outbursts are normal reactions to somewhat abnormal circumstances. What about ourselves? Let us, in good psychiatric fashion, look at the facts. In the last 100 years, we in the Western world have created a greater material wealth than any other society in the history of the human race. Yet we have managed to kill off millions of our population in an arrangement which we call war. Aside from smaller wars, we had larger ones in 1870, 1914, and 1939. During these wars, every participant firm <clears throat> firmly believed that he was fighting in his self-defense, for his honor, or that he was backed up by God. The groups with whom one is at war are often from one day to the next looked upon as cruel, irrational fiends whom one must defeat to save the world from evil. But a few years after the mutual slaughter is over, the enemies of yesterday are our friends. The friends of yesterday are enemies. And again, in full seriousness, we begin to paint them with appropriate colors of black and white. At this moment in the year 1955, we are prepared for a mass slaughter which would if it came to pass, surpass any slaughter the human race has arranged so far. One of the greatest discoveries in the field of natural science is prepared for this purpose. Everybody is looking with a mixture of confidence and apprehension to the statesmen of the various peoples, ready to heap all praise on them if they succeed in avoiding a war, and ignoring the fact that it is only these very statesmen who ever cause a war, usually not even through their bad intentions, but by their unreasonable mismanagement of the affairs entrusted to them. In these outbursts of destructiveness and paranoid suspicion, however, we are not behaving differently from what the civilized part of mankind has done in the last 3,000 years of history. According to Victor Chubilet, Chur Chubilets? From 1500 BC to 1860 AD, no less than about 8,000 peace treaties were signed, each one supposed to secure permanent peace, and each one lasting, on an average, two years. Our direction of economic affairs is scarcely more encouraging. <clears throat> we live in an economic system in which a particularly good crop is often an economic disaster, and we restrict some of our agricultural productivity in order to stabilize the market although there are millions of people who do not have the very things we restrict and who need them badly. Right now, our economic system is functioning very well because, among other reasons, we spend billions of dollars per year to produce armaments. Economists look with some apprehension to the time when we stop producing armaments and the idea that the state should produce houses and other useful and needed things instead of weapons easily provokes accusations of endangering freedom and individual initiative. <clears throat> we have a literacy above 90% of the population. We have radio, television, movies, a newspaper a day for everybody. But instead of giving us the best of past and present literature and music, these media of communication supplemented by advertising fill the minds of men with the cheapest trash, lacking in any sense of reality, with sadistic fantasies which a halfway cultured person would be embarrassed to entertain even once in a while. But while the mind of everybody, young and old, is thus poisoned, 
we go on blissfully to see to it that no immorality occurs on the screen. Any suggestion that the government should finance the production of movies and radio programs which would enlighten and improve the minds of our people would be met again with indignation and accusations in the name of freedom and idealism. Well, no. <clears throat> we have reduced the average working hours to about half what they were 100 years ago. We today have more free time available than our forefathers dared to dream of. But what has happened? We do not know how to use the newly gained free time. We try to kill the time we have saved and are glad when another day is over. Why should I continue with a picture which is known to everybody? Certainly, if an individual acted in this fashion, serious doubts would be raised as to his sanity. Should he, however, claim that there is nothing wrong and that he is acting perfectly reasonably, then the diagnosis would not even be doubtful anymore. Yet many psychiatrists and psychologists refuse to entertain the idea that society as a whole may be lacking in sanity. They hold that the problem of mental health in a society is only that of the number of unadjusted individuals, and not that of a possible unadjustment of the culture itself. This book deals with the latter problem, not with individual pathology, but with the pathology of normalcy, particularly with the pathology of contemporary Western society. But before entering into the intricate discussion of the concept of social pathology, let us look at some data, revealing and suggestive in themselves, which make reference to the incidence of individual pathology in Western culture. What is the incidence of mental illness in the various countries of the Western world? It is a most amazing fact that there are no data which answer this question. While there are exact comparative statistical data on material resources, employment, birth, and death rates, there is no adequate information about mental illness. At the most, we have some exact data for a number of countries, like the United States and Sweden, but they only refer to admissions of patients to mental institutions, and they are not helpful in making estimates of comparative frequency of mental illness. These figures tell us just as much about improved psychiatric care and institutional facilities as they tell us about increase in incidence of mental illness. The fact that more than half of all hospital beds in the United States are used for mental patients on whom we spend an annual sum of over a billion dollars may not be an indication of any increase in mental illness, but only of an increase in care. Some other figures, however, are more indicative of the occurrence of the more severe mental disturbances. If 17.7% of all rejections of draftees in the last war were for reasons of mental illness, this fact certainly bespeaks a high degree of mental disturbance, even if we have no comparative figures referring to the past or to other countries. The only comparative data which can give us a rough indication of mental health are those for suicide, homicide, and alcoholism. No doubt the problem of suicide is a most complex one, and no single factor can be assumed to be the cause. But even without entering at this point into a discussion of suicide, I consider it a safe assumption that a high suicide, suicide rate in a given population is expressive of a lack of mental stability and mental health. That it is not a consequence of material poverty is clearly evidenced by all figures. The poorest countries have the lowest incidence of suicide and the increasing material prosperity in Europe was accompanied by an increasing number of suicides. As to alcoholism, there is no doubt that it too is a symptom of mental and emotional instability. The motives for homicide are probably less indicative of, of pathology than those for suicide. However, though countries with a high homicide rate show a low suicide rate, their combined rates bring us to an interesting conclusion. If we classify both homicide and suicide as destructive acts, our tables demonstrate that their combined rate is not constant, but fluctuating between the extremes of 35.76 and 4.24. This contradicts Freud's assumption of the comparative constancy of destructiveness which underlies his theory of the death instinct. It disproves the implication that destructiveness maintains an invariable rate differing only in directions toward the self 
or the outside world. The following tables show the incidence of suicide, homicide, and alcoholism for some of the most important European and North American countries. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so there's a table here with a, a bunch of Western countries and their suicide rates. Um, I think for 1951, uh, it's on page eight. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, cause there's a lot on there. A quick glance at these tables shows a remarkable phenomenon. Denmark, Switzerland, Finland, Sweden, and the United States are the countries with the highest suicide rate and the highest combined suicide and homicide rate, while Spain, Italy, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland are those with the lowest suicide and homicide rate. The figures for alcoholism show that the same countries, the United States, Switzerland, Sweden, and Denmark, which have the highest suicide rate, have also the highest alcoholism rate, with the main difference that the United States are leading in this group and that France has the second place instead of the sixth place it has with regard to suicide. These figures are startling and challenging indeed, even if we should doubt whether the high frequency of suicide alone indicates a lack of mental health in a population. The fact that suicide and alcoholism figures largely coincide seems to make it plain that we deal here with symptoms of mental unbalance. We find that the countries in Europe which are among the most democratic, peaceful, and prosperous ones, and the United States, the most prosperous country in the world, show the most severe symptoms of mental disturbance. The aim of the whole socio-economic development of the Western world is that of the materially comfortable life, relatively equal distribution of wealth, stable democracy and peace, and the very countries which have come closest to this aim show the most severe signs of mental unbalance. It is true that these figures in themselves do not prove anything, but at least they are startling. Even before we enter into a more thorough discussion of the whole problem, these data raise a question as to whether there is not something fundamentally wrong with our way of life and with the aims toward which we are striving. Could it be that the middle-class life of prosperity while satisfying our material needs leaves us with a feeling of intense boredom and that suicide and alcoholism are pathological ways of escape from this boredom? Could it be that these figures are a drastic illustration for the truth of the statement that man lives not by bread alone? and that they show that modern civilization fails to satisfy profound needs in man. If so, what are these needs? The following chapters are an attempt to answer this question and to arrive at a critical evaluation of the effect contemporary Western culture has on the mental health and sanity of the people living under our system. However, before we enter into this specific discussion of these questions, it seems that we should take up the general problem of the pathology of normalcy, which is the premise underlying the whole trend of thought expressed in this book. 